The Vietnam War. A massive American aircraft carrier prepares to launch a bombing raid. Warplanes and men are crowded on deck. Then, a fire rips through a jet fighter. Seconds later, the stern of the ship is rocked by a series of huge blasts. Everyone was terrified. The sights were horrible. As fires rage, the crew fights to save the vessel. Come on! 17 hours later, 134 men are dead. What caused this horrific loss of life? Now, a top Navy investigator delves into one of the most famous disasters in US military history. Using computer simulations, we reveal what really happened on board the USS Forrestal. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Southeast Asia. North Vietnam. July 1967. America is battling a messy ground war in North Vietnam. The body count is rising fast. To date, more than 6,600 U.S. military personnel have died in the conflict. President Lyndon Johnson wants to finish the job. In an all-out bid for victory, he ups the number of bombing raids. But the war is thousands of miles from American soil, and the bombers need bases. Vital to the new strategy are the US Navy's aircraft carriers. These massive war machines can launch air assaults from hundreds of miles offshore. Sailing to its first tour of duty in Vietnam is the biggest of them all, the USS Forrestal. It cost $189 million to build and has a crew of 5,400 men. The flight deck is vast. Stood on end, it would reach the 80th floor of the Empire State Building. Forrestal represents four acres of American sovereign territory, able to travel anywhere in the world. July 29th, 8 a.m. The ship has reached the Gulf of Tonkin, 100 miles off the coast of North Vietnam. It's been stationed here for five days, launching bombing raids against the Viet Cong. These are dangerous waters. Three years earlier, enemy fire hit a warship just a few miles from here. 9 a.m. A bombing mission is scheduled for mid-morning. The pilots slated for the second mission head to their briefings. One of them is Junior Lieutenant Dave Dollarhide. Back home in Florida, 25-year-old Dave had a busy social life as a single man. But the discipline of the Navy changed him. I joined the Navy to become an aviator and grew up, actually, in the Navy, matured in the Navy. Flying alongside Dave on the mission is his good buddy, Fred White. 32-year-old Fred is a family man. He and his wife, Marianne, have three young children back home in Florida. But for Fred, flying a fighter jet is his life's ambition. Well, I'd like to think I was his first love. <laughs> but he loved flying so much, too. Of course, it was a dream, a dream come true for him. The squadron commander briefs Dave, Fred, and the other pilots on their mission. Morning briefing. The target is a railway line on the outskirts of Hanoi, just south of the Chinese border. Their mission is to destroy the line and cut off a critical supply route to the enemy. Be carrying two, 1, the commander explains that today, they'll be carrying different bombs. A day earlier, Forrestal received eight tons of bombs from the ship USS Diamond Head. The explosives are old and in poor condition, 
some of them dating back to World War II. When the Forstall's weapons officer sees the bombs, he decides to get rid of them as soon as possible. Today's mission is Dave's fourth in five days, but he's relaxed about it. We didn't expect to have any trouble in, the, in our flying that day. It was routine. 10.30 a.m., Dave Dollarhide and Fred White cross the flight deck to their planes. The deck bristles with activity as flight crews prepare 27 fighter jets for the mission, loading them with fuel and missiles. The deck of a carrier is one of the most dangerous working environments in the world. One wrong step can suck a man into an engine or blow him overboard from a jet's exhaust. The ship is a floating arsenal, packed with a deadly mixture of high explosives and fuel. In the event of a fire, one man is responsible. Fire Chief Gerald Ferrier is in charge of Repair 8, an emergency response unit of specially trained firefighters. Colleagues regard the 31-year-old father of four from Arkansas as the best in the business. 10.32 a.m. As Dave completes his pre-flight checks, he looks at the missiles being loaded onto his fighter. One catches his eye. It's an older device that was delivered yesterday. The bomb was large, not designed for high-speed carriage. It had rust all over it from being in storage for a long time. But there's no time to worry. The schedule's tight. Dave and Fred climb into their cockpits and make final adjustments. The bombing mission is just minutes away. The planes are Skyhawk A4E bombers. They're fast, nimble jets, able to carry 6,000 pounds of explosives. Six Skyhawks crowd the port side at the back of the carrier. Dave Dollarhide's aircraft is two planes away from Fred White's. Their job is to bomb the railway line, but they'll need support. Over on the starboard side are seven McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom Jets. Flying Phantom number 110 will be senior pilot Jim Bangert. His job is to protect the mission by destroying anti-aircraft guns on the ground. The Phantom is twice as fast as the Skyhawk and loaded with weapons. Among them are 24 Zuni rockets, housed in pods on either side of the fuselage. With a top speed of 1,600 miles an hour and a range of five miles, each Zuni packs a devastating punch. 10.46 a.m., the ship swings into the wind to give its planes maximum lift for takeoff. Forstall's steam-driven catapults hurl the first two planes into the air. They accelerate from zero to 150 miles per hour in three seconds. 10.51 a.m., the plane's engines are powered up by mobile generators. The deck crew arms the missiles and the pilots make their final checks. 10.51 and 21 seconds. Dave Dollarhide and Fred White prepare to take turns on the catapult. Suddenly, there's a flash and a loud bang. Jet fuel spills onto the flight deck and spreads rapidly. A massive fire rips through the Skyhawks. Flames engulf Fred and Dave. They only have seconds to get out of their cockpits, or they'll be burned to death. Seconds from disaster will return in a moment. And now back to seconds from disaster. USS Forrestal, the world's biggest aircraft carrier, is on fire. 
flaming jet fuel rages across its flight deck. 10.52 a.m. Pilots Fred White and Dave Dullerhide struggle to get out of their burning jets. They have just seconds to escape. In the searing heat and smoke, Dave tries to unbuckle his shoulder harness and leg straps. I was terrified about what was going on, but I understood that my life depended on me getting out of that airplane. Finally, he breaks free and prepares to jump, only to realize that he's still connected by his oxygen cord. He rips it off and braces himself for the 10-foot jump onto the flaming flight deck. I just leaped out the left side of the airplane, twisted in the air, and fell on my side. Dave feels a bone shatter in his lower back. He writhes in agony on the deck, unable to get to his feet. The flames spiral out of control as Fire Chief Gerald Ferrier and his men race to the blazing Skyhawks. Gerald Ferrier reaches the fire first, armed only with a handheld extinguisher. He gives it a test blast to see if it's working, then starts spraying it on the flames underneath the first Skyhawk. Dave Dollarhide lies helpless on the deck. The blaze creeps toward him, but he can't move. Injured men scream in pain all around him. Everyone was terrified. The sights were horrible. The fire and the, the shrapnel. Everyone was fearful that they would be next. Dave looks back at the row of burning Skyhawks. Some of his fellow pilots are still trapped. I could see people running from the fire, people still in their cockpits. Defenseless against the, uh, the fire that was around. 10, 52, and 55 seconds. 94 seconds after the start of the fire, Gerald Ferrier and his men are still battling the flames. Then, a massive explosion rocks the Forrestal. The shock wave is so intense, it causes a brief glitch on the ship's camera. The blast kills Gerald instantly and most of his firefighting team. Then, nine seconds later, another huge explosion. This second blast is even more powerful and rattles the supercarrier to its core. The impact leaves a 10-foot wide hole in the armor-plated deck. Burning jet fuel pours through the breach into the heart of the ship, killing many below deck. In the mayhem, crew members battle to get the situation under control. Ten fifty-five and 20 seconds. The fire has been blazing for almost four minutes. Dave Dollarhide still lies on the flight deck. And time is running out. He has to get away before he's engulfed in flames or blown to pieces by another explosion. Adrenaline surges through his body. And despite suffering a broken hip and elbow, he forces himself to his feet. Bombs sizzle behind him. But can he get clear in time? The fire was everywhere, and the thought going through your mind is to just escape. Dave gets only a few feet from the wreckage when a third explosion knocks him down. Four more blasts tear the rear of the ship apart. Ten fifty-seven a.m. Less than six minutes after the fire starts, the ship is in serious danger of sinking. Condition zebra throughout the ship. Alarms sound, and watertight doors close all over the carrier. 
This is Condition Zebra, sealing off the damaged compartments to limit the spread of fire. But closing the hatches cuts off many escape routes. 10.58 and 20 seconds. Crew members see Dave Dollarhide's motionless body on deck. They haul him to his feet, amazed that he's still conscious. He's dragged to safety just in time. They make it to the sick bay, but Dave fears the danger isn't over. We could hear the noises on the hangar deck above us, and we knew the fire was still raging. But fire is no longer the primary threat. The crew pumps millions of gallons of seawater into the port hold of the ship to tackle the blaze. In a cruel twist, they are putting themselves in grave danger. USS Forrestal and 5,400 men are close to sinking. When seconds from disaster returns. Operation Desert Storm, war against an invading dictator or a battle for oil. The final report, Desert Storm, premieres next. My dream is to ditch the corner office, even if it's just for the weekend. Life's calling. Where to next? Max Mancini's Nature Valley. Pyramid Peak, Colorado. Where's your nature valley? 100% natural, whole grains, delicious. Introducing Chase Freedom. It feels like no other credit card in the world. And it works like no other card too. Feel free to choose cash back. And then change to points and then change again, all with the same card and without losing a thing. That's freedom. Chase freedom. Get it free at chase.com slash freedom. Tomorrow night, crashing planes to make them safer. Crash test science takes flight. Then nearly 200 million tons of goods cross the Panama Canal each year. But now this 19th century marvel is struggling to keep up with 21st century demands. And this machine is contradicting the theories we know and telling us how the universe really began. Tomorrow beginning at 8, crash science planes, followed by Panama Canal unlocked and birth of the universe on the National Geographic Channel. Call today for the Gold Delta Sky Miles credit card from American Express and start earning double miles in more places more often. Apply now and get 17,500 bonus miles right away. With award tickets starting at just 25,000 miles, you can fly free sooner. Plus, the card is fee-free the first year. Call 1-800-SKY-MILES. Call now for the Gold Delta Sky Miles credit card and earn two miles for every eligible dollar you spend. For even faster travel awards on Delta and 18 airline partners, take advantage of this great offer today and get 17,500 miles closer to a free trip. Plus, enjoy the card fee-free the first year. Call 1-800-SKY-MILES now. We now return to seconds from disaster. The USS Forrestal is in a critical situation. The aircraft carrier is listing dramatically as sailors struggle to fight fire above and below decks. <coughs> Along with the blaze, they're now well aware that Forrestal's 80,000 tons is on the verge of capsizing. If that happens, they will all go down with it, all 5,400 men on board. Frenzied, the crewmen rush to the fuel tanks to pump oil from one side of the ship to the other. They have to get weight to the starboard side, 
or the ship will be lost. Across the deck, thousands of pounds of explosives sizzle in the extreme heat. Captain Belling orders the crew to get rid of anything that might detonate. They jettison multi-million dollar planes and tons of bombs into the ocean. Eleven forty a.m., forty-eight minutes after the first explosion, the crew finally puts out the fires on the flight deck. They pump enough oil across the ship to correct its listing, but it takes another sixteen hours to extinguish the fires below deck. By four a.m. on July thirtieth, Forrestal's commander, Captain Belling, makes an announcement to his crew. At the end of 17 hellish hours, 134 men are dead. One hundred sixty-one men are seriously injured, many with horrific burns. The worst are airlifted to a hospital ship. I saw some horrible things, and many of my friends died. I was the only one in my flight of four to live that day. I was very fortunate to live. Crew members recover the body of Dave's best friend, Fred White, from the Gulf of Tonkin. Probably the very most difficult thing that any mother could do is to tell her children that their father is gone. The carrier begins a week-long journey to an American base in the Philippines for emergency repairs. The ship's tour of duty in Vietnam is over after just five days. And the Navy has to find out exactly what caused the disaster. What started the blaze? How did it get so out of control? What caused the multiple explosions? And why did so many men die? Now, by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal the facts behind one of the most infamous episodes in U.S. naval history and inspect restricted files that hold the key to the incident. The day after the near sinking of the Forrestal, the U.S. Navy orders an in-depth investigation that leads to a complete overhaul in safety procedures. This man has a professional interest in Forrestal. Commander Bob Stanley is a leading U.S. Navy investigator. Thank you. Fantastic. He's well qualified to judge the historical impact of this disaster. Forestall fire was a watershed event, if you will, in the terms of the amount of damage done for an accident in naval aviation history. Stanley uses his credentials to gain access to the USS Forestall's official investigation document. Under federal law, filming the contents of the report is forbidden. But Stanley reopens the files so we can learn how the original Navy investigators cracked the case. The man who carried out the Forrestal investigation was Rear Admiral Forsyth Massey. Massey is now deceased. But back in 1967, the respected officer put his reputation on the line by vowing to get to the bottom of the Forrestal disaster. Stanley knows that Massey faced a tough challenge. Many witnesses were dead, and fire destroyed much of the crucial evidence. What remained was at the bottom of the ocean. Without the physical evidence, it's a huge obstacle for any investigation to determine what really happened. Massey's job is to find out if the Forrestal fire was a freak accident or if it could happen again. The report reveals that Massey's first step is to interview hundreds of eyewitnesses. Question one, what caused the fire in the first place? Frankly, Admiral, uh, I had assumed that we had been attacked. Many believe they had come under enemy fire. Well, sir, the uh, second explosion was more violent than the first. They report seeing missiles strike the ship and bombs exploding on deck. Massey has one definite way to find out, the radar. 
Forrestal is equipped with one of the most sophisticated radar systems in the world. It has a range of 200 miles and can detect aircraft 50,000 feet above. But on reviewing the ship's logbook from July 29th, Massey discovers that the radar detected nothing. With hostile fire ruled out, Massey starts to look for answers closer to home. His most important piece of evidence is footage shot by the onboard camera. Massey orders copies of the footage, hoping it will reveal all. The Pilot Landing Aid Television System, or PLAT, is no ordinary camera. A radar link displays the aircraft's speed on a dial at the top of the picture. Footage from the Platt camera should enable Massey to analyze the Forrestal disaster frame by frame. Just before the fire starts, the cameraman records two planes taking off. Then, as he stands by to film the next takeoff, something catches his attention. Quickly, he pans left and captures the fire as it ignites the rear deck. Although black and white, and suffering from electronic interference from the ship's radar. The film holds forensic clues in its detail. Massey analyzes it shot by shot. With an investigator's eye for detail, Massey discovers evidence hidden in the footage, evidence that will be key to understanding how 134 crew members of the USS Forrestal lost their lives when Seconds from Disaster returns. You're watching Seconds from Disaster. In 1967, Rear Admiral Forsyth Massey investigated a huge fire on the aircraft carrier USS Forrestal. Today, Top U.S. Navy investigator Bob Stanley has gained access to Massey's official classified report. I was impressed reading Admiral Massey's report that they followed the same techniques and mythology that we use today. It was a very thorough report. But Stanley has yet to find out how Massey solved the mystery. Massey's report reveals that an onboard camera recorded the horrifying scenes on the ship. The footage is a huge bonus. But there's one big drawback. The cameraman is facing the wrong way when the fire starts. By the time he pans left, the fire is already ablaze. The first crucial five seconds of the event are missing. And those five seconds could reveal what caused the fire. It's now that Massey's obsessive attention to detail pays off. When analyzing those first five seconds before the camera swings around to film the fire, Massey spots a flash by the plane on the foredeck. He watches it over and over again and sees a clearly discernible flash underneath the plane that's about to take off. This fighter jet is on the runway toward the front of the carrier. But the actions of the men in the foreground don't match what appears to be happening right in front of them. One of them turns and points, not toward the flash, but in the opposite direction, to the rear of the ship. Massey is confused. Why don't the men react to the flash directly in front of them? He goes back to his interviews with the deck crew. They confirm that they did see a flash, but they saw it near the phantoms on the starboard rear of the ship, the opposite end of the deck to the flash Massey spotted. Then something catches his eye. He realizes he's been looking in the wrong place. The answer isn't in the footage. It's in the Platt camera that filmed it. The Platt camera is surrounded by clear plexiglass on the part of the ship known as the island. The plexiglass is in front of the camera lens to protect it from dirt and debris. 
Massey's new theory, the flash is actually a reflection. Because the camera was filming through curved plexiglass, it captured a reflection of a flash that took place somewhere else on the ship. If his theory is correct, the flash is a reflection of the start of the entire incident. Could this clue unlock the entire mystery? To find out, Massey arranges an optical test. He arms a team of men with flashes. He gets behind the plant camera and studies the reflections of the flashes in the plexiglass. One flash perfectly replicates the original flash caught in the plexiglass seconds before the fire started. Now he can locate the exact spot where the flash happened. It must have come from the Phantom at the very end of the rear starboard deck. That plane is Phantom 110, Jim Bangert's fighter. Somehow, according to Massey's theory, Phantom 110 launches a rocket that strikes Skyhawk 405 directly opposite. But this raises more questions than it answers. How could a rocket, a six-foot Zuni, fire across the deck and cause such devastation? Each Phantom has a built-in safety mechanism to prevent that from happening. Highly trained air crews follow detailed safety procedures. So what went wrong? Was it human error, an electrical failure, or even a breakdown in Forrestal's safety procedures? With many other Phantoms in service, are more disasters lying in store for the US Navy? Massey needs to check out the safety mechanisms on Bangert's Phantom to find out why they failed. But Bangert's jet is at the bottom of the ocean. So Massey tracks down another Phantom. To understand what Massey finds out, present-day investigator Bob Stanley needs to find a Phantom of similar vintage. The F-4 has been out of commission since 1996. But the National Warplane Museum in Horseheads, New York, has one on site. And it's outfitted for action like the one that Bangert flew. Each launch pod connects to the cockpit controls via an electrical circuit. When the pilot presses the fire button on his joystick, it sends a signal to the pod, which launches the rocket. But on the deck of an aircraft carrier, this should be impossible. As a safety measure, launch pods aren't electrically connected to the cockpit until seconds before takeoff. Only when the plane is on the catapult does the deck crew ready the launch pods for combat. They do two things to achieve the connection. First, they remove a safety pin from the pod. Then they plug in a device called a pigtail. Once plugged in, the pigtail completes the electrical circuit between the launch pods and the pilot's joystick. Now, if a Zuni rocket is accidentally released, like in this demonstration, it fires harmlessly out to sea. The entire system should be foolproof. So why did the safety procedures fail this time? Massey discovers that the safety pins are anything but safe. When they're in position, the safety pins act as a circuit breaker. But high winds on deck can pull on the pins' ribbons, ripping them out of the holes. Some are even found lying on deck. Massey's investigation establishes there was a high wind on the day of the fire. In order for this pin to be effective, it needs to be completely seated. In high wind condition, like they had that day at 32 knots, these pins have been known to come out partially and also completely. Massey believes that on the day of the disaster, 
the safety pin had been blown out of its position in the launch pod. But there was a backup safety mechanism, the pigtail. It is only when the pigtail is plugged in that a rocket can be fired. That's why the crew is ordered to plug them in just seconds before takeoff. But in interviews with the men, Massey discovers exactly why a Zuni rocket went off. Massey's investigation now takes him back a few weeks to the Forrestal's journey to Vietnam. During training missions on the way over, pilots argue that plugging in the pigtail while a plane is on the catapult slows down operations. If there's a malfunction, the plane has to be removed from the catapult, which holds up other planes in line for takeoff. The pilots point out that in a combat situation, a delay like this could be fatal. Exactly a month before the fire, while the Forrestal was still sailing to Vietnam, the ship's weapons coordination board met to discuss the men's concerns. It ruled that flight crews could ignore Navy protocol on connecting the pigtails. From now on, they could plug them in, not when the planes were on the catapult facing out to sea, but when they were on the rear deck facing each other. The ruling was never made official, but the crew immediately begins to act on the board's decision. Massey now knows there was nothing to prevent an electrical pulse from reaching the pod of the Phantom and setting off a rocket. Clearly, an electric pulse did activate the rocket, but where did it come from? That's his next puzzle, and the biggest mystery yet. Could it be that pilot Jim Bangert pressed the fire button? Massey listens to a recording of his interview with Bangert again. Under oath, the pilot states that he flipped just one switch to turn on the plane's power. Massey carries out his own checks on Bangert and finds that he has an impeccable service record and is one of the ship's safety officers. Even though Massey believes Bangert, that doesn't help him trace the source of the electrical pulse. He listens to Bangert's testimony repeatedly. Uh, yes, sir. I started up the starboard side engine, and uh, I felt the jolt, and I saw a yellow orange. Suddenly, he makes the connection. A power surge. The jets on Forrestal have to be powered up before takeoff by an external source. Once the mobile generator powers up the plane, Bangert needs to flip a switch in the cockpit to change the power supply from the external source to the internal source. This is the key moment. When you move these switches to on, that is when the missile fired. It was really the, the shift of power sources. It was unregulated there for a brief moment, giving a transient surge of power. At the precise second Bangert flips the switch, a shower of stray electrical currents surge through the plane. One rogue current finds its way into the circuit that connects the joystick to one of the launch pods. With the safety pin out and the pigtail plugged in, the current reaches the pod and fires the deadly rocket. 120 pounds of high explosive shoots across the deck, creating a fiery disaster. Rear Admiral Massey now knows what caused the fire, but how did it rage out of control so quickly? Fires are a regular hazard on the deck of every aircraft carrier. On average, there's one every five days on Forrestal. Highly trained and well-equipped firefighting teams are on board to extinguish these blazes quickly. So why couldn't they put this one out? Massey looks at the plat footage to see how the crew tackled the original blaze. When the fire first breaks out, Chief Fire Officer Gerald Ferrier rushes toward the Skyhawks, holding only a handheld extinguisher. 
other members of his eight-man team grabbed the hoses. But just 94 seconds after the start of the fire, there's a huge explosion, and everything changes. Gerald Ferrier is killed instantly. Five more firefighters are also killed, and the blast badly injures the other three in the team. In a matter of seconds, all the trained firefighters are out of action. Untrained men now fight the inferno. As the original footage reveals, they use both water and foam. But a seasoned accident investigator like Massey knows this is a disastrous error. The crew should only use foam. The combination of foam and water doesn't work when tackling a fuel fire. The lighter than fuel foam covers the blaze, acting as an oxygen robbing blanket, but the water washes away the foam, allowing the fire to flourish. Even worse, the heavier water carries the flaming jet fuel on its surface. Unwittingly, the crew actually spread the fire. It was an uncontainable fire at that moment for the crews. They were overwhelmed, and they did not have the training to contain the fire on the forest all. So Massey now knows why the fire spread so rapidly. But this still doesn't explain the biggest mystery about forest all. What caused the series of deadly blasts that killed so many crew members? Seconds from disaster will return in a moment. And now back to seconds from disaster. Naval accident investigator Forsyth Massey knows what triggered the Forrestal disaster. A rogue Zuni rocket slammed into a Skyhawk. But he still needs to solve the biggest mystery of all. What caused the massive blasts? Reviewing the footage of the disaster, Massey is intrigued by the actions of Chief Fire Officer Gerald Ferrier. On the film, he runs over wearing no protective clothing and armed with just a fire extinguisher. Gerald would have known that every bomb has what's called a cook-off time. The time it takes for a bomb to explode when exposed to extreme heat. The bombs usually on board a Skyhawk have a cook-off time of two and a half minutes before they detonate, giving a man with an extinguisher time to start cooling them down. But now, for the first time, Ferrier must have realized that he was dealing with something entirely different. The bombs on the burning deck were the aging, rusty devices delivered to Forrestal just the day before. He had no idea when these bombs would go off. Present-day investigator Bob Stanley commissions an explosives expert to compare the cook-off times of these old weapons with those of the modern bombs usually carried by the Skyhawks. His tests are revealing. The cook-off time of the older bomb is over a minute less than that of the modern munition. By the time Ferrier gets to the bombs, one is already split open and burning white hot. He screams at his men to run for their lives. He must have realized that they would blow up in seconds. Stay back! He was not concerned about his own personal safety, and so he sacrificed his life in an attempt to save the ship. In all, seven of the older bombs on board Forrestal detonate. Had the Skyhawks been armed with their usual weapons, Gerald would have had an extra minute to prevent detonation. And that, according to the explosives expert, would have been enough time to stop the bombs from going off. If we'd have had just 60 more seconds, more than likely we would have been able to get the fire under control a lot quicker, which would have prevented other weapons from going off. In his final report, Massey confirms that the decision to arm Forrestal with old decaying bombs 
is the cause of many of the 134 deaths. The old bombs were on board because in 1967, the US military was running out of explosives. Yet the government was increasing the number of bombing missions to Vietnam. So the fateful decision was made to arm Forrestal with these older, more volatile weapons. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day, and by following the evidence uncovered during the extensive investigation, we can finally reveal the chain of events that destroyed USS Forrestal and killed 134 men. 10.45 a.m. A mobile generator powers up Phantom 110 on USS Forrestal, and an armorer plugs in the pigtail. 10.51 and 21 seconds. Pilot Jim Bangert flips the power switch. A stray electrical current surges through the plane. The safety pin is not in position. There's nothing to stop the current as it travels all the way to the launch pod. It activates a Zuni rocket. The rocket crosses the rear deck of the ship chest height at speed. It slams into the fuel tank of another plane, a Skyhawk 405, releasing 400 gallons of jet fuel that ignite. The impact of the rocket knocks two old rusty bombs from the jet's launch pods. Each contains 1,000 pounds of explosives. The first will detonate in 94 seconds. 64 seconds to bomb cook-off. Dave Dullerhide finally breaks free and leaps 10 feet. He lands hard, breaking his hip and his elbow. 60 seconds to cook off. Gerald Ferrier tries to cool the bombs. 30 seconds to cook off. Fred White is still trapped in his cockpit. 10 seconds to cook off. Ferrier must have realized his efforts are doomed. The first bomb reaches cook-off point. It explodes and kills 27 men instantly. In the next four minutes, six more bombs detonate, releasing 40,000 gallons of jet fuel, which catch fire. The burning fuel pours through fractures in the deck into berthing areas below, killing 91 men. Of the 134 dead, 18 bodies are never recovered. As a direct result of the Forrestal catastrophe, the US Navy takes decisive action to ensure that a disaster like this will never happen again. Safety procedures are completely overhauled on all carriers. Old bombs are replaced with newer insulated devices and fire training is made mandatory for the entire crew. A new fire training center is set up in Virginia. It's named after the man who gave his life trying to save the forest home, Gerald Ferrier.